Welcome to Guy Shrink, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm here in Toledo, Ohio, the Glass City, at our Cogito Studios in downtown, beautiful downtown Toledo. Jordan Valdivia is my producer and engineer and compatriot and partner in crime, and Keegan Berner, who's also another partner in crime, is our engineer right here in town. So uh, we welcome Kathleen Smith, who is a faculty member of the Bowen Center in Washington, D.C., and the writer of one of the absolute most fantastic and fun read books on how to manage my anxiety entitled Everything Isn't Terrible. Isn't that a great title? Everything Isn't Terrible. And so uh, on Guy Shrink, Kathleen, uh, welcome. And uh, we, we talk about well, what keeps a guy awake at night. And uh, you probably have had some experience with that. <laughs> with other people on the on the couch so so kathleen what do you think keeps a guy awake at night what keeps a guy awake at night right yeah i mean i i i want to say for a lot of the people i work with it's uh other people and other people's (laughs) relationships you know if my wife and my son would only get along then i could calm down right um uh that other focus that gets us every time uh you know not every guy but that's what i what i hear a lot Sure. Well, other people are the problem, right? Exactly. (laughs) Well, you have written a a wonderful book on how to manage anxiety called Everything Isn't Terrible. And I'd just like to ask you, how did you come up with that title? And would you just tell a little bit about your work? Sure. So uh, I have a very good agent, I would say, for for writers (laughs) who helped me come up with the title. Um, You know, I always joke about it has a long subtitle, but Subtitles these days, uh, publishers try and guess what people are going to type into Amazon or to Google, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so they right, try, right. Try and hit as many uh, buzzwords as they can, uh, but that's why they probably got the word anxiety in there as well. But I have the the privilege of being a writer, but also being a counselor, and I've found that as sort of a a niche thing to be able to do, you know, that there are a lot of people who want to write about mental health and a lot of people who want to work as a clinician, but being able to do both is really fun for me to be able to switch back and sort of working with people and their challenges and then being able to, to challenge myself to describe what it actually looks like for people to, to grow up a little bit, myself included, to be able to take, you know, theoretical concepts that can be kind of jargony and confusing and being able to kind of describe them using, you know, layman, <laughs> layman's turns and every everyday examples. It's always a fun challenge for me to, to, to practice doing them. Yeah. You talked about uh, jargon. The word anxiety is, is a jargon. And when I pitch your book, which I do a lot because I think it's a fantastic read, I say that you're a, a therapist in Washington, D.C., which is the most anxious city in the country. And so <laughs> would you say a little bit about what anxiety is about, at least from your perspective? Sure. You know, so I think of anxiety as, you know, something we all have that's useful for us. It's uh, it's part of our bio- biology, our DNA. As as living organisms, we na- need to be able to respond to threats when we encounter them, right, <laughs> as quickly as possible. The trouble is with humans is that we have this magical power of being able to imagine potential threats, right? Not just respond to the threat in front of us. So that's helped us survive as a species, but it's all, it can also really get in our way too, because our, uh, you know, depending on how we experience challenges growing up in our families, other people's reactions to threats, right? That alarm in our brains gets a little out of whack, right? And we're more quickly to sort of label something a threat or scarier than it actually is, you know? And so, um, anxiety is useful, but it's it's it doesn't always reflect the reality of what's happening. Oh, that's a, a really good uh, insight that you're saying there, because a- anxiety is a is a major um, industry in the mental health industry, uh, and uh, certainly in the in the pharmaceutical industry as well. And you have a piece in your book where you just say make make anxiety your friend. Uh, that is that's a rare message to be heard. What do you mean by making anxiety your friend? Yeah, you know, uh, the writer Elizabeth Gilbert in her book about creativity, I don't know if you've read it, it's called Big Big Magic. She talks about how anxiety is along for the ride, but it doesn't have to drive the car. You know, it's it's in the back seat saying, I don't know, this is... We shouldn't be going this way, you know, and it's my job to say, I, th- 
I think we're I think we're good. I appreciate your concerns. Thanks for chiming in, but I think this is the way I want to go, you know, and I always joke with people. I tell them I name my anxiety Carl. I don't know what that says about me that I gave it a male a male name. No offense to guys. Um, there's a Freud there's something Freud in there. I know that. <laughs> but you know, um so people, my friends will say, oh, you know, how, how's Carl doing? And I was like, yeah, he's a little worried that I'm a fraud or that I, I'm really annoying this person. But, I, you know, he's, I, mean, I, I try and kind of um, talk him down, you know, talk him off the ledge, right? Talk him down. Uh, and I think adding humor to it at least has been useful for me to try and see that, uh, you know, my anxiety has my best interest at heart, but I don't always have to listen to it. It's not always operating on the facts. Maybe it doesn't even have access to the facts, um, you know, and that's not a, a sign that I have to ignore it. It's just a sign that I need to, to strive harder to see what's really happening uh, versus what I imagine is happening. I think you made the, uh, the point about the, it's important to observe, observe yourself and observe what's happening in, in that context and then evaluate your behavior and then perhaps think about interrupting your automatic. I think that was uh, three moves that you had said about how to manage anxiety because we talked about oh, how to manage anxiety. Well, here's, some, here's three steps to think about to do that. Right. So I think of that as sort of fine tuning the alarm system, right? Slowly teaching your brain that someone disagreeing with you, that failing, that being rejected, these are all survivable things. Um, and I think a lot of us learned that to some degree growing up, <laughs> but some of us didn't as much, right? And luckily, what you know, what we know about the brain and it being a changeable organ, right? That uh, that we can teach ourselves that over time, we can sort of learn what's what's really a threat and what's not, you know. And but the challenging thing is that doesn't really happen in the counselor's office or the therapist's office that at least from a Bowen theory perspective that happens going out into your relationships with other people is where that, where that learning process happens. Yes. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It, it's one thing sitting in a counselor's office or a, co a coaching session or, or whatever, but it's the taking whatever it is you learn there and applying it to particularly intimate, close, difficult, relationships. Does this work? Can I get this figured out? Because uh, anxiety is contagious. I get it. I get it from those who got it. And then I like to spread it around. And often difficult relationships, wherever they might be, are the, are the cause of anxiety. Yeah. You know, I tell my clients that when somebody they're related to or somebody they're really allergic to, uh, <laughs> upset with them. You know, I, I try and be sensitive, but I also say, what? oh, great. This is such a wonderful opportunity. You know, this is where the, the practice, you get the practice, right? This is where you get the mileage <laughs> um, and, and learning to kind of define yourself and, and, and teach your brain uh, that you're, you're going to be okay. Well, the, perhaps the first step in that, though, is you said uh, people who you might be allergic to. When we start labeling like that person's an allergy to me or worse than that, that's a toxic person to be avoided. I never get around to managing myself in that relationship because I've distanced myself or whatever you want to cut, cut off, got rid of them. And I don't have to deal with it anymore, which doesn't really work. Yeah, you know, I call it, I talk about this in the book, I call at least working on yourself and your family, I call it the high altitude training, you know, when athletes will train at a higher elevation to get that sort of one, 2% competitive edge, you know, and if you're only chatting about the weather, if you're only making duty visits, you know, once or twice a year, you don't really get that, you know, that practice of managing yourself and calming yourself down, you know, when you're allergic to, if you want to call it that, to others, um, it's hard to really to interrupt the anxiety and the dynamic if you're not sort of putting in the the time. And that doesn't mean you spend lots of time with every person you don't like. <laughs> but being able to look for opportunities and say, you know, a question I have for my clients is, what's the relationship that's the hardest to be curious about? You know, someone who seems really boring, really annoying, really anxious. <laughs> Um, it's really hard to be interested in watching the dynamic uh, in those relationships. So that can be a useful starting point is, is to say, where, where am I not curious? 
And where do I need to practice sort of using that front part of my brain to, to pay attention to what's happening? Um, okay. And you're, as you've been talking to people, what, what might be some of the places where people um, are least inclined to work, uh, whether it's a boring person or, you know, an aunt or an uncle or whatever. In your experience, what are some of those places that are difficult to work? I think for people who come to think about and work on their marriage, I think often the previous generation, they don't really see the connection. They don't see how working on being less allergic to a parent, you know, who's still around or to a sibling Uh, That's not the previous generation, but their own nuclear family, so to speak. They don't see how that's connected to them sort of being able to calm down and and be less anxious in their in their own marriage because their focus is so on that relationship, you know, and I think that speaks to the distance, you know, that speaks to how they've used not spending time with people, not sharing about themselves with them uh, to manage things. And then they don't get that practice. They don't get that high altitude training. And then all the intensity gets, you know, gets stuck in the marriage. I do a lot of, that's, most of my practice is devoted to couples. And uh, that's exactly what I discover is if something isn't working in your family, so to speak, your family of origin, guess who gets the, guess who's the recipient of that anxiety? <laughs> you know, your spouse. And that's one of the things that keeps that guy up awake at night. I can tell you that, is trying to figure out uh, my wife and kids and uh, why I can't stand to be around uh, her, her parents or my mother or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You talk a lot about in, in your book about differentiation of self. Now, that's a fancy idea. Uh, wh- what's that about? Well, you could, I sometimes just use the catch-all term maturity or, or growing up. Um, you know, but this idea that it's, there's an individual component to, to working on your own maturity or being more differentiated, there's a relationship component as well. I use, I'm not a basketball fan, but I use the, the metaphor of, you know, if you're, you're learning to hit a three point shot, right? You practice the mechanics of that, right? Over and over. But then in a game, you have other people who are very invested in you not making that <laughs> shot, right? That's the relationship component, right? You can yeah. figure out what you believe and what you're going to do and what you think is the best way forward. But then you got to go home for Thanksgiving. (laughs) Then you got to say to someone, well, you know, I think about this differently, or I'm not willing to do that, you know, and that's the, that's the tough piece. But people all often want to rush to that. They want to take a stand or take a position, but they haven't done the time. They haven't put in the time of sort of teasing apart their own thinking about what they actually believe or who they're trying to be. Um, you know, and then it just ends up being all reactivity and sort of engaging in just conflict, right? Versus um, thinking about the position you want to take. And so each each piece is is critical, but you you can't just have one when you're thinking about how do I how do I grow up a little bit or or how do I be more differentiated? I mean, in Bowen theory, Dr. Bowen described it as separating your your own thinking from the emotional reactivity or the emotional piece, and then being able to separate your own thinking from the thinking of others, right? Um, which is, both of which are very difficult to do uh, when anxiety is high. Which, which why it, it takes practice, you know, not just shooting the three-pointer with no one around yeah. and to be, I love that, it's a great, that's a great metaphor, it really is. Recently in a blog that you wrote, you, you talked about four questions to ask about growing up, I think it was questions to help you grow up. And uh, I'm really intrigued by that. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask one of them is, what did I ever learn because someone else would always do it for me? Um, The the question of under-functioning. Could you say a little bit more about that as an idea? Yeah, I think we all have gaps in our own maturity. You know, we had people who are willing to do things for us, who are willing to function for us. And there's nothing wrong with that. Perhaps they were, you know, you had somebody in the family who was particularly skilled and and one thing, right? <laughs> Somebody who loved to cook, you know, and who wasn't too interested in teaching you how to. So that's okay. You just got, got along doing that. But being able to sort of see, you know, what's the cost of always having somebody do something for you, you know? I'll give you an example. So, you know, we're in, we have a kid in school, we're in DC, we're doing lots of rapid testing, which can, <laughs> can be anxiety producing. Um, my husband was the first one to do a rapid test. 
And so he learned, it's not a very difficult thing to do, but he just learned how to do it. So I'd always make him do it, you know, <laughs> I'd say, okay, you, you do this. I'll figure it out how to do it later. Right. There's nothing wrong with that, but what disturbance does that create, you know, in a marriage or in a relationship? Does one person begin to come become resentful that the other person isn't willing to do this? You know, that they're the default functioner. <laughs> um, you know, how much flexibility is there for the other person to step up and take over if needed, right? Or, um, you know, just the, it's not about, um, it's not about the behavior, it's about the inflexibility, it's sort of how fixed do you get in these positions? And I think when a person is willing to sort of do a survey of themselves, I don't know, maybe annually <laughs> um, or every now and then to be able to say what, you know, what have I not learned to do? You know, that as an adult um, is a pretty useful life skill. You know, that can be technical stuff, but it can also be emotional stuff, you know, uh, or being able to stand up for yourself on a position to be able to define what you actually believe versus having, you know, your family or a religious organization <laughs> tell you what you believe, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think we all have those those examples of where we've sort of just leaned on borrowing from others uh, versus sort of uh, build what, what I call sort of building up self. And okay. it's helpful to think about. I think a person who's actively working on that um, is maybe going to have less less tense relationships or relationships that are freer, more enjoyable. It certainly has implications for parenting. If I'm the parent that does everything for my kid, uh, while I want to be helpful, it's all, all, all good m motivation, what I really tell my kid is you're completely incompetent unless I'm doing this for you. Yeah. Well, that, don't, that, don't <laughs> Dr. No. Bowen said, you know, um, everything you do as a parent is either promoting emotional separation or inhibiting it. And that's, Whoa. that's a sobering, thought. <laughs> you know, what am I doing most of the, most of the time, you know, am I promoting uh, my child being a person uh, or am I not in this moment? You know, they're, they're going to be, it's never going to be a hundred percent thing, but I think it's helpful to think about. Can I let them be distressed for a minute while they figure this out, you know, or am I going to swoop in and. Yeah. I, I have feelings about your feelings, and I don't like my feelings about your feelings. So would you quit having your feelings so I'll feel better? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a meta emotion. I think is what that's called. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, another question that you asked on, on here's four ideas on how to grow up was when I when am I more focused in managing others than managing myself? Most <laughs> of the day. <laughs> You know, I'm from a, I don't know if this is a, a gender thing, being Southern, growing up sort of in an evangelical church. I am so quick to host everybody, make everybody feel oh, welcome. Oh. That is okay. my thing. Um, and that is just being, I had a client who, who used the, term, the phrase once and I love this. He said, I'm exquisitely tuned into others. And I, I said, yeah, wow. I know the feeling. <laughs> Um, wow. and so, you know, that's, that takes up a lot of energy and attention. There's not a lot left to think about how you want to direct yourself when that radar of how's everybody feeling? How's everybody doing? Does somebody feel left out? Does, have I offended somebody? You know, those are useful things to ask every now and then, but when that's the, that's a hundred percent of the focus, You've really lost yourself in that. Yeah, you don't have any time to manage yourself or just think about yourself or work on yourself, whatever you want to call it. You're too busy with everybody else. Um, it, was it uh, something that said that, you know, religious activity is my favorite escape from God? Um, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, An Anthony DeMello, a Jesuit priest in India, once said that. But yes, uh, being busy it helps me not to focus on myself and what's what am I what am I about as a person you talk about defining yourself on some uh, in relationships on, on a, some some principles the the whole notion of uh, having principled behavior which could you say a little bit more about that that's something we don't think very much about 
Right. Principles is kind of an intimidating word. But if you ask most people, do you think you're a principled person? People would say, yes, I, I'm a principled person. <laughs> and you say, what are you know, what are your principles for being a parent? You get like the blank. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm slightly guilty of this myself. You know, what are your principles for being a being responsible in your marriage? You know, or responsibly for yourself in your marriage um, as a citizen, you know, as a as a believer, if you, you know, have have um, a religious affiliation, um, you know, at your work for doing good work. You know, those are useful things to think about. Uh, or here's another one for using social media. You know, how many people signed up for Facebook and said, what, <laughs> how, how do I want to use this? How do I determine what's useful behavior and what's unuseful? You know, um, when am I kind of um, straying away from that? What does that look like? You know, that's very helpful thinking that I can't imagine hardly anybody does, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but it's mm -hmm. it, because if you don't have principles, then you're just doing what everybody else does. Or you're doing the opposite of what everybody else does just because to spite them, you know, <laughs> because mm -hmm. you don't want to do that, you know, then it mm -hmm. becomes about the reaction and not about what you actually think. Mm -hmm. You mentioned social media. Would you say a little bit about, because you touch about, touch this on your, in your book, about uh, social media as one of the sources of our societal anxiety and how to manage myself on my iPhone or my Android or whatever it is, or, or subscribing to certain social media things like Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, well, you know, I think um, <clears throat> I talk about this in the book, you know, so many years ago, you know, if you we use our relationships to, to calm down a lot of the time, that's the idea, right, to manage anxiety. And, you know, 100 years ago, well, maybe go back a little farther because you've got telephone then, but, <laughs> you know, you would just had who was in your household, right? Or you had to go out the door and find somebody but now I can text some a friend and say, this is this is OK, right? Would you have done this in this situation or you won't believe what so and so did? Um, or I'll scroll through Instagram and say, well, you know, is my life like all these other people's? Am I measuring up right? All the ways we kind of borrow from others is very convenient. So it's not I don't think of it as a different animal. I think of it as doing what we've always done. It's just a more efficient way. <laughs> um, and so that that really complicates things. It makes it that much harder to focus on managing yourself, to be thoughtful about it, um, just because, you know, it's such a part of the culture. Again, going back to those principles and that good thinking of what does it look like to successfully or thoughtfully engage with this? What is the purpose? Why am I signing up for this? <laughs> How do I want to use it? When do I want to use it? Um, those are all great questions, right? Um, how do I know when I need to take a step back? Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because what most people do is they get addicted or too sucked in and then they just cut off, right? They delete it mm -hmm. and then they just go back in, right? Um, mm -hmm. versus sort of how do, how do I thoughtfully engage with this? This is something mm -hmm. I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that could, that could be useful to, to think about. Uh, I've sometimes recommended taking a, a, a two week hiatus from Facebook, for instance, of course, some of the facial reactions I get when I say that is what, what are you out of your mind, Bill? I mean, come on, I, I won't know what to do when I wake up, but a, a, a two week thing and then see how much time did you spend on there? Do you know? And most of us don't, don't have any idea. The other thing I found out about uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram particularly is that I compare my life to somebody else's, and, and usually in a negative kind of way. Yeah, you know, I think that's that. Um, and Bowen there, at least what's called borrowing self, right? How we how we evaluate ourselves, right? Um, they're the culture, the world, you know, as we see on the internet, especially has so many ways it wants to tell us <laughs> what to value, what success looks like, how to live, right? What your relationship should be like. Why wouldn't you just, you know, there's so many people who are, ex who are quote experts, right? Why wouldn't you just, you know, I think of being like a little squirrel, like just borrow, mm -hmm. <laughs> borrow up all that thinking, right? Um, Versus sort of sitting down first and say, well, what do I actually think it looks like to to be a good parent, you know, to be uh, 
to be a good citizen, you know. Uh, and then maybe I can see what other people think. But ma- but mm-hmm. I want to do that thinking first before I dive in and mm-hmm. see what mm-hmm. see what the world defines as as doing good, you know. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I really appreciated about your book is you, you really did a, a a great job of delineating out the, the certain arenas in which we show up in life, like my family of origin. Um, my, my friendships, my, my intimate relationship with a spouse or partner, uh, my children, uh, my my business, my 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 job, and and how principled behavior can can make each of those places a much richer experience if I take some time to think about it and look and be cognizant and observe the way I operate. Um, particularly, I'm thinking in the job market thing. We talk about uh, a crazy place right now. Uh, careers, career assessment, the great resignation. Uh, how, how do you see anxiety manifesting itself in the workplace? Well, that, I mean, you brought up so much right there. I mean, I didn't even think about that, uh, that in terms of people leaving their jobs right now, you know, how much of that is coming from self versus just sort of looking to what others are doing or needing the immediate relief of <laughs> leaving your job, which is going to be yeah, pretty right. sweet right, right, and appealing. Right. Um, so as something being self-employed, I never have to, <laughs> to worry about, but. Um, Same here. I'm going to fire myself, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think, um, I think people really, you know, they, they are just so individual focused that they just don't see the relationship piece of it if there's no sort of apparent conflict they just it's hard to see sort of the system at work and how um and how you can sort of dr i sorry i mentioned you dr bone a lot but that's this where these all these ideas come from you know he talked about taking sort of the the view above the stadium right as the game is going on i call it sort of the the press box view or sometimes i call it the astronaut's view if you want to zoom out even further but being able to sort of see people moving see people doing what they do to manage the anxiety and how that gives one a different perspective than being on the field or being in your corner right and how all of a sudden you know um you're focused on your part in it a little bit more to say, well, this is how everyone else has sort of chosen to respond to it. Do I want to be in that? Do I think that that's useful? And sometimes it might be, or is there, is there a different way of managing this tension uh, than just what's sort of automatic for me or what's automatic for the office, this organization, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because I think it's, 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 it can be easier to see sort of the his, the multi-generational history in a family. It's a little bit harder to see or want to be curious about the sort of the emotional history of a, of an organization or, or a workplace, but I think it could be useful. Yes, indeed. There's a, and I don't remember the name of the author, but there's a book that's, that I've used before called The Anxious Organization, which is a, it's a fictional account of a, and it goes through all of the ways by which everybody in that organization participates in the anxiety, not just one or two people who, like the terrible boss. It isn't just a terrible boss that he or she might be reacting to a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and, and, and so uh, uh, the workplace can be a very anxious place, and I bring a lot of it t- to the place. Absolutely. You know, and to, and to take it on to an even broader spectrum, you know, I think about on a national level as well if you think about like Mm -hmm. political polarization you know people think that of that as sort of a symptom or a problem but if you're thinking systems that conflict is actually quite adaptive you know (laughs) that's that is stabilizing things to a degree are there costs to that oh yeah there are Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but seeing that as sort of doing what humans do right to see someone else as being wrong or being the villain that is very stabilizing for an individual or for a group, right? Uh, but when that becomes the only way of managing the tension, then you then you run into problems. But being able to see that at work, sort of on a, you know, on a national level, or maybe this happens at your workplace or in other groups, certainly in a family, uh, I think is helpful for folks because they it's harder to sort of label people as the ones to blame or the or the villains when you see see it as the system doing its best to keep things calm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's certainly something that keeps a guy awake at night is, is, <laughs> is work, is work. Sure. And with the guys that I work with, that's, that's probably the, the number one or two issue that they come to bring when they come to seek some therapy or counseling or coaching or whatever you want to call it, is how do I manage the workplace? And it usually begins with how do I deal with that difficult person over there? not recognizing that part of the difficult person has to deal deal with you and what do you bring into the difficulty sure. and that's a that's a tough thing yeah you know in dc i talk with a lot of folks where they you know they're in workplaces where the expectation for output is just not realistic you know <laughs> everyone's burnt <laughs> out everyone's expected to work a million hours and everyone keeps asking well you know why, why is this? Why are, why are they doing this to us? Not realizing their part is going along with the expectations, right? Versus mm-hmm. define, you know, their cost of that. Maybe you would get fired. <laughs> Maybe your boss right. wouldn't be happy with you. But when people automatically go along with the definition that's been set of what good work looks like, of sort of what showing up looks like, um, that's the, there's no self in that right? Um, that's the that's the the system at work, right? You have people who place certain demands, and then you have people who, who just sort of conform to those demands without any thinking. Um, and it's it's easy to just blame one person as you you expect too much of me, you're too hard on me. But then where's, yeah. what's the other part in that, you know? As long as I'm doing it, they're going to keep expecting it. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, there's, perhaps there's no such thing as, uh, I didn't have a choice. I really didn't have a choice in it. Well, yeah, you did have a choice. <laughs> you, could, you could quit. And, uh, so, yeah, okay, so the, so the work thing is a big, uh, is a, is a big deal. I, I'm really interested. You've referenced Dr. Bowen several times. And um, could you say a little bit about how, how is it that you found Bowen theory and what drew you to that? I was a very anxious graduate student uh, (laughs) and a doctoral program at George Washington. And, you know, when you're in grad school, you have to find an internship placement. And I was looking around to see sort of what the opportunities were in D.C. And I heard about this place called the Bowen Center. I learned a little bit about Bowen theory, you know, from just taking family therapy classes. But they told me, they said, well, you can come and intern here, but you have to work on yourself in your family for a year first and you know and do our program before we'll let you and i was like oh this is interesting nobody else is asking that of me you know um and asking me to be responsible for myself in that way and so i started reading you know some of dr bowen's writings i read you know roberta gilbert's book extraordinary relationships and you know the it's like, I think of it as like sort of looking at your family and it's like a pinball machine. All of a sudden you see everything light up. Right. (laughs) And it's fascinating to watch. Um, and I, um, my mom died when I was in college. And so I had a relationship with my dad that was very close, but I think I was very much trying to over function in that relationship. Mm -hmm. And it was useful for me and thinking about how can I step back and let my dad actually surprise me and be a capable human and how, how better a relationship we would have, uh, you know, because that pressure was off and, you know, it was useful for me in, um, in other arenas in life. Um, you know, I always tell, I always joke with my husband. I said, if I hadn't been thinking Bowen theory, when we were dating, you would have been too mature for, you would have been too for mature for me. We wouldn't, <laughs> we would have broken up, you know, and he laughs at that, but I really think it's true, you know, that, um, that, that work on self was helpful for me and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. so I was, mm-hmm. I, I was sold, um, you know, and I, there's all this interesting research about um, what uh, the psychotherapy theories are useful for the client. And, you know, often the research will say it's not so much the theory itself, it's, it's the clinician's own investment and belief that it's, it's, been useful for them that makes the biggest difference. Uh, and I, I really believe that, you know, because oh, I, yeah. Will never stop being curious about other people's families. <laughs> I hope that makes me useful as a counselor uh, because I might be a little bit less anxious because I'm using that front part of my brain um, mm-hmm. to help, hopefully, to help people think about their families. And so, yeah, that's sort of how I, I fell into it, and they haven't been able to to get rid of me. So, oh, that's well, that's cool. That that that's really good. Yeah. I, I, just think of the way they. Um, 
they reformulated internship. You can come, but you first have to do this before you can come. And you said, nobody else asked me to work on myself. It's kind of like internship is another way for cheap slave labor to happen <laughs> f- for a yeah, year or two. They say, oh, well, no, you sh- yeah, you should be in therapy or counseling yourself. You should probably do that. That's important, you know. But, you know, this idea that you're not going to be useful to anybody if you're not doing this thinking for your for yourself, oh, right? no. No, no. Dr. Bowen said something like, um, uh, difficulty in relationships are best solved within that relationship. So you have to focus on that relationship that's problematic and your position in it. Yes, yes. I, I, I had a similar journey to Bowen theory, um, you know, in a previous, uh, in a previous career. Uh, and, uh, and it was the only thing that helped make sense of conflict and the way other people operated and seeing my own place in the conflict. Yeah. Uh, and it, it made so much sense. And since then, I've been you know, hooked on Bowen theory <laughs> and you know, uh, worked with Dr. Gilbert and worked with Kathleen Cawley and, yeah. and uh, Tony Wilgus and some others uh, at, at the center. Well, I think it's also very humbling, right? Once you see in your own life how slowly that change actually happens, how many attempts it takes to do something differently, I think it helps reduce some of the anxiety working with other people. There's not this rush <laughs> to sort of get people to function differently. Um, and I think that's that's useful, right? There's not this mm-hmm. mindset of, yes. eight, yeah, here's your insurance, eight sessions, boom, you're fixed, go, you know, go live your life, right? Yeah. Seeing it as the long game, the a lifelong process. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Kathleen, what do you think would be a, a, a couple of principles coming out of what you're thinking as far as a, a, like a, a leader would be a leader in an organization, even a family leader, but particularly I'm thinking a business leader, organizational leader. What might be some principled kinds of ways to behave that are different than some of the management theories that are out there? Oh, that's a great question. I, as a clinician, I want to turn it back on you and be like, what do you think? But I'll, <laughs> right? Because that's what you should do with the person you're working with. <laughs> this is my this. show. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know, I think that's so great. I think that might be uh, for different, different for different people. I, but I think for me, you know, um, being able to say something like, I, I, you know, I'll look for opportunities to step back and let people surprise me with their capabilities you know that's a hard one for me to do and i think a lot of people who might be in leadership positions maybe they were the oldest Mm. in their families maybe maybe their way of calming things down is to Mm -hmm. swoop in and take over Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. that's not necessarily different than other leadership advice but i think it maybe that's a a little bit of a different way of phrasing it you know i think of that as seeing the reality versus seeing what anxiety tells you you know can i really look and see what people are capable of what they can do for themselves. It might be different. It might be less efficient than how I would do it. Uh, but ultimately, it's more useful for them and for me in the long run for them to become more capable. You know? Yes. So stop being the problem solver for everybody in your organization. Uh, one of the questions I have encouraged guys, particularly in management, to ask, what have you done to solve this problem before you came to me? And and to say, I, I'm fully capable. I'm fully uh, convinced that you can figure this out. As opposed to saying, I can't believe how stupid you are. Yeah. 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 I think another one is, um, you know, I'll, a- I'll ask people's thinking, ver- you know, instead of assuming it. You know, how that, again, that's that, that togetherness of the organization. You know, how, how often do I think I know what other people think? Do I assume that they're going to do X, right? Versus just asking them. <laughs> well, it's so obvious, <laughs> right? But just, um, you know, just saying, what's, you know, what's your thinking about this? Um, it's so, it's, what do you think is going to happen? What would you like to happen? <laughs> uh, this applies to the family as well. You know, it, it, it's so funny to me how we don't think to ask people these things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example real quick. I worked with a woman once who, um, her, uh, mother had died sort of leaving her adult father you know widower and she was just jumping into that position of doing things for him and assuming he was going to have a hard time and i asked her i said you know we have you asked her dad what what he thinks life is going to be like now 
or what he wants for himself, you know, what he thinks, what he thinks he's going to have a hard time with. Uh, and she said, you know, it never, it never occurred to me <laughs> because I, we're just close and that's the family. I just assume I knew what he needed. Right. And I think that's easy to, to do in an organizational setting as well. You know, the higher the anxiety, the more you're going to have that mind reading or that, or that assuming, uh, because we just think we know better or because the idea of approaching people and engaging their thinking is a little, a little stressful. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty scary, yeah. because what what happens if I misguessed, uh, mi, you know, miscalculated, yeah. and find out that I I really want to go in this direction and they are, they're completely over here? Yeah, wow, well, wow. Kathleen, this has been a, a great conversation. I, I I really have appreciated the time. What's the weather like right now? You guys got gobs of snow in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> we did have some snow this weekend, but it's pretty much all pretty much all melted. Um, so. But we've had some fun getting out with our, our three-year-old, letting her play in it. And make it definitely makes it magical again. <laughs> oh, some, yes, yes. It's annoying. As opposed to trying to drive or take the uh, take the metro, right? Yes, yes. Right. Well, I, I do ask uh, all my uh, guests, one. the final question is, um, do, do you have like a, a little elevator speech, a, a one line or two of advice about uh, for, for guys that l- stay awake at night, uh, fussing and fuming? Uh, what, what, what might that be? Yeah, I mean, I just go back to the power of curiosity, you know, Um, curiosity is paying attention to what's happening without trying to manage anything except yourself, you know, and that really is the opposite of anxiety. (laughs) Anxiety wants us to fix things as quickly as possible, as as with much familiarity as possible. Um, it wants us to overfunction for others to calm everybody else down so we can calm ourselves down, you know? And so that's a question I have for people is sort of what would it take to begin to be curious about this? You can't be curious at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, maybe some people can. I cannot, you know? <laughs> I am full on autopilot, you know, in, in the middle of the yeah. night. Yeah. And, you know, off. so if you don't take the time to really be engaged and curious about it, your brain's going to cu- catch up with you. Anxieties, that's when it comes knocking at the door, right? At midnight saying, uh, I think we have some things we need to be worried about. <laughs> uh, so often the people who will set aside that time to be really interested um, and curious about what's going to make a difference, what hasn't worked, you know, ha- bringing that objectivity to it. Uh, you know, the anxiety can be in the back seat then, right? Um, it doesn't feel like it has to necessarily step in and, and take over. It's still there. Um, but you know, that's, I think that's why working with, with, with the coach or some, or a counselor or somebody else is so useful because it is setting aside that time to be curious with somebody who's not that invested in it. You know, I, it's easy for me to be curious <laughs> because I don't have these problems. I'm not related to these people. Right. And I think that that's useful for folks to, 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 it's sort of one person's front of the brain speaking to the other person's front of the brain. And, uh, you know, that's where all the, the good work happens, not the back of the brain, right? That is absolutely great, great advice. And uh, what, a, what a great way to finish our, our conversation today. So curiosity is the best antidote to, uh, to anxiety. And make anxiety your friend. Uh, try, try it out for a couple of days and see what happens. So, so our guest today, Kathleen Smith in Washington, D.C., a therapist at the Bowen Center in Washington, also the author of a fantastic book called Everything Isn't Terrible. So thank you for being with us, Kathleen. Thanks a lot, Bill.